Okay, so then um, I would like to switch to the, uh, the, the third file, the tracking. Oh, it's already on? Oh, great, thank you. So we talked about registration, image registration, making one image align or match with the other. Um, this is like a global thing. Uh, but in many experiments, um, especially when your data is, for example, a time-lapse series, and that's what we're going to talk about now. So if your data is a time-lapse series of images, uh, a movie, then uh, usually you're interested in uh, not just global matching, often that doesn't even make sense, you're interested in particular objects within the image that you really want to detect and segment and follow over time in order to be able to study its dynamics, to study their dynamics. So that's really a problem of tracking and it's a, a more specific or more detailed question than just a global image registration. So let's look at a bunch of examples of, uh, of tracking. Uh, I'm going to show you um, some of the problems that we have worked on in the last couple of years, and they all focused more or less on microscopy. So I'm, I'm going to show you microscopy applications in, uh, in, in this part of the talk, mostly. Um, so why is this interesting? Well, of course, life is very dynamic, as it says in the top of this slide. Uh, at almost or at all possible scales of observation, both spatially and temporally, uh, things are moving. And um, if you really want to understand processes in living organisms, you really have to uh, get to the details, uh, detect objects, and follow them over time and study their dynamics. So that's really a tracking problem. So for example, we've looked at, uh, this is all the way from the molecular scale. So here you see the tips of microtubules within the nucleus of a cell. Uh, here you see the cell itself, the nucleus dividing. So this is in mitosis studies or studies of um, cell cycles uh, or uh, all the way up to the millimeter level approximately of um, the development of an embryo, in this case a C. elegans, roundworm. And they're all very different tracking problems. I mean, here the cells are quite well separated and quite clear. Here it's already much more noisy and very dense, um, and here it's a, it's a complete mess. Really. Okay, so tracking has become a really popular subject in microscopy in the last 10 years or so. If you look at cell tracking, particle tracking in the, in the PubMed, it explodes. Uh, this is also, you can explain this, I mean, it was around the mid-90s that people figured out how to uh, clone and use uh, fluorescent proteins and to tag them to specific targets in the cell to make them light up and to, to film them over time, basically. So the need for tracking has really grown uh, immensely since the mid-90s. And many techniques have already been developed. There are many tools for tracking cells or particles. Uh, if you're interested, um, we're not going to discuss all these, these um, tools, but if you're interested, you can read a little survey paper that I wrote last year, which also lists all these tools. But what I'm interested in is the common approach that people are using in these tools. Most, in most cases, it really goes like this. You start with your images. Uh, usually there's some pre-processing, like deconvolution, uh, image enhancement, uh, denoising. Um, and then there is a detection algorithm somewhere in that software tool that takes the frames one by one and tries to localize and detect the objects that you're interested in. But most software tools, the way they do it is they completely ignore neighboring frames in the sequence. They just take them individually one by one, try to make a detection. So for every frame, you get a list of potential object positions. And then in the next stage, a linking algorithm is applied where you could use all kinds of image features also. You could classify those detections, which may provide a little bit more information in trying to make optimal links from frame to frame between detections to generate trajectories that you can then visualize, analyze, and this will give you probably will lead to some new hypothesis and the generation or the acquisition of new images and the process starts all over again. So we're going to talk briefly about uh, particle tracking and cell tracking in, in this talk. Um, popular methods for particle tracking are, for example, Gaussian, using a Gaussian model 
of the of the spots and fit them to the image. So first you could initially do a very simple thresholding to, to roughly localize where spots are and then to refine that by using Gaussian fitting. Why do they use Gaussians? Well, if we, if we talk about individual particles, like single molecules even these days, um, they are much smaller than the resolution of the microscope, of a normal optical microscope. So really in the order of nanometers or tens of nanometers, whereas the, uh, the resolution of an optical microscope, a confocal microscope is like 250 nanometers or something. So it means that when you use such a microscope to look at single molecules moving around, you're basically looking at point spread functions. You have your point spread functions all over the place and they move. Um, and the point spread function of a microscope is well approximated by a Gaussian. So that's why it's a very popular method, but some other methods are used as well. Uh, methods for linking, subsequently linking those detections are, uh, for example, using a nearest neighbor approach. So for every detected particle in one frame, you just look at what is the, the closest in the next frame, and then going on and on like this, you build a traje trajectory. Or people use template matching sometimes, which is really, then it becomes a local registration problem. You take a patch of image information and you try to find that same patch in the next frame using, for example, a correlation. Um, and many methods more and more these days also use some kind of prediction uh, motion models to predict uh, where the, uh, based on the past information, where the, the, the particle will be in the next frame. There have been some studies already 10 years ago about what the accuracy is of these methods for detection, uh, particle tracking. Uh, Gaussian fitting was uh, found to be quite well suited, obviously, because that's the theoretical model that you should find in the image. But all these methods break down uh, if the signal to noise ratio is about four or lower. And the signal to noise ratio of four is really nothing special in, uh, in fluorescence microscopy. Because the thing is, if you use lasers to scan your cells to build up the image, you basically kill your sample. Uh, you're heating it up and, and you will kill your sample. So to, to reduce photo damage, laser power is usually kept to a minimum, <laughs> as low as possible. But of course, when you do this, you also uh, drop the signal to noise ratio. So almost by definition, in this kind of data, the signal-to-noise ratio is always crap. It's, it's usually below, uh, below four. So meaning all these methods are, uh, are uh, you know, so-so. They're not so, um, not so accurate. Um, so we did a lot of research on this. Can we improve on this? Uh, and I'm just going to show you uh, some of the um, things that we've been uh, working on, some of the things that we've thought about. Suppose uh, my signal to noise ratio is 1.5, and this happens a lot in single molecule studies. Um, let's, let's, just, let's just look at such a single particle moving around. So here I have one image from a sequence. It contains one particle. Uh, do you have any idea where it is? <laughs> signal to noise ratio 1.5? No, it's, you cannot see it, right? Well, I mean, you can guess, but there are many possibilities talking about uncertainty. So if I now show you the movie, you do have some idea of where this particle might be. Sometimes it disappears in the noise, sometimes it comes up because it's a completely random process. So this shows you that the human visual system does a lot of integration of information over time to make a better detection for each individual image. Now, this principle is almost never used in, in, in those tracking uh, techniques. So the human visual system is uh, maybe not so very accurate and reproducible in precisely quantifying where that thing is, but it's very powerful in making associations and, and integrating information. So the research challenges for us were, can we build a technique that does a much better job in integrating spatial and temporal information can we, use, uh, can we somehow incorporate prior knowledge models of both the dynamics and, and the, um, the observational um, aspects or what the, what the particle looks like based on the 
the imaging properties of the system, the point spread function? And can we do things more probabilistically rather than deterministically? Because even as a human expert observer, you would not say, yes, I'm 100% sure it's there, exactly there and there and there. Uh, you, you would assign probabilities. It's probably there. I'm almost sure it's there. So, I mean, this is the way we, we look at data as well. So it makes perfect sense to express detections, locations, or whatever you're inter interested in, in terms of probabilities, rather than making very hard decisions from point to point. Now, this can be naturally done using a Bayesian uh, estimation uh, approach. I'm going to check my clock. Okay, we have 10 more minutes or so. So what is Bayesian estimation? It means... Um, it's a technique to compute the degree of belief in the target states by taking into account all available information up to the current time. So it's really integrating information over time up to the current time and then makes a prediction for the next time point. It's an online tracking method. So what are target states? That's a bit of a vague term, of course. Um, that's basically anything that you're interested in, anything you want to measure in your data. It could be position, velocity, acceleration, shape, intensity, or whatever you want, you put that into a vector which describes the object or the properties of the object that you want to keep track of and in a probabilistic way. So what we're going to do is we're going to put P here of XT, so it's going to be a probability density distribution, and that's the thing that we're going to estimate all the time. So I'm going to show you some formulas. If you're not used to it, please don't uh, uh, be shocked, but uh, I'm going to explain at least the idea. So we have the probability distribution of that target state for the time point t minus 1, given all the observations basically all the images from the first time point until that time point t minus one. That's what they call the posterior for the previous time point of the, the estimation of this uh, state. And now we have a dynamics model that expresses our prior knowledge that we have about this, these objects that we want to follow over time. And um, it expresses in a probabilistic way what is... Um, uh, how the, the target state in T minus 1, um, what is the probability of the, the, the target state in T given uh, the, the, uh, the state in the previous time point? So it predicts. So this is multiplied, integrated, and it gives you a prediction of the state in the new time point given all the information you had up to the previous time point. And then this prediction is then multiplied with a likelihood function which uh, so this this d uh, incorporates all the prior knowledge about the dynamics motion, and this l is like an observation model where you can in, uh, put in your prior knowledge about the imaging system, like the point spread function, etc. What the uh, objects look like, and this gives then the update for the current time point. So it gives in a probabilistic way what is the current state of uh, my object or the properties that I want to keep track of uh, given all the information I have up to the current time point and that goes then into this formula again you predict and using the incoming information of the new image for time t it gives the, uh, the posterior so this is a recursive process every time you make a prediction and you confirm it with the incoming image information and you make a prediction and you accumulate or integrate information all, all over time this is a very optimal way uh, to, do a, to, uh, to build a, a tracker in a probabilistic way. So we did that. We uh, built trackers like this. We also validated them. So there we go again, <laughs> the validation aspect of uh, validation. Um, here we used synthetic data uh, to really have a hard ground truth. And it's also easy to do because in these imaging processes we can model the whole imaging process very accurately. We know exactly the noise properties, the point spread functions, you, you know quite accurately what the image should look like and you can really for different signal to noise ratios um, then compute for different motion models also diffusion or directed or switching between um, a diffusion and directed motion uh, what the accuracy is. Well we did a comparison, this is already a couple of years ago uh, for our method called a particle filtering method um, 
and we compared it with uh, both a commercial uh, tracker uh, velocity and a uh, an open source uh, particle tracking algorithm called particle tracker and both in terms of um, the root mean square error in localizing points um, we were able to do a better job and also in making the right associations for different densities 10 20 40 uh, particles that we wanted to follow um, so this worked quite well this is one of the first examples we didn't track everything here i think because of computational issues at the time because it took a lot of computation time uh, but in very very noisy this is real data so this is like i mean this is the nucleus of a cell which is approximately like this so we have microtubules moving here and the signal to noise ratio is quite bad but still we can do a, a pretty good job then we thought we had this framework this probabilistic framework and remember i told you there's a dynamics model and an observation model and basically that this that describes the whole thing if you want to apply this framework to another completely different application the only thing you have to do is plug in another dynamics model and another observation model so at some point we we uh, started to collaborate with people from the radiology department and uh, they were looking at um i think uh, stem cell uh, therapy in heart failure um, some kind of molecular imaging uh, problem um, and so one of the things you need to do then is to quantify the heart motion to see if it really is a healthy uh, if it's healthy or not um, so following the heart quantifying the motion of the heart is uh, done in, in human beings uh, in human subjects using a tagged MRI for example this is uh, I think a movie of a rat heart with tagged MRI and when we saw those images we thought okay maybe we can just use the very same tracking uh, algorithm but we just need to figure out the right dynamics model and the right observation model uh, to make it fit uh, suitable for for MR so basically if you if you look at this pattern this tag pattern you could say uh, this these crossings these line crossings they are my particles you know like in microscopy there are bright spots but here there are the crossings of of, of uh, two lines why not you just you can just uh, try to describe that mathematically as a model and try to fit that to your data and it works quite well actually the very same framework but plugging in different models can then be used can be transferred from uh, some application in microscopy to an application in uh, MR um, so it tracks the um, the, the line crossings quite well and once this is done of course you can compute all kinds of things dynamic properties like strain this was published last year if you're interested um, uh, yet another application of uh, tracking particles we got images like this from uh, someone from the cell biology department he was interested in the dynamics of microtubule tips in neurons so this is really a dendrite and you see those microtubule tips but if you zoom in or if you don't zoom in but it's uh, either way it's uh, pretty messy I mean it's very difficult to tell what's going on really you see some motion but what is really going on he didn't know he, did, he didn't know how to how to measure it he wanted to do many many experiments um, so you really need to automate it and computerize things so what do you think would it be useful to apply a two-dimensional or three-dimensional tracker to this problem that would be a bit stupid actually to do because you know the motion is very 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 constrained there's only motion along this linear uh, structure so uh, using a full-blown 2d or 3d tracker doesn't really make any sense um, so this is an example of think about what what do we need really uh, can we constrain the problem uh, a bit more to, to get a more robust estimate so what we did is we used chymographs so you can draw a line along this structure and then uh, you can parameterize the the position along the line this, it becomes a one-dimensional problem now it's just x along the line position along the line and then you can uh, measure the intensity for each time point and you really get a spatial temporal plot like this so this is for this line and that's for this line um, and this is another way to integrate spatial and temporal information in one view you now know you have all your information of the whole movie for that particular line 
And then all of a sudden you see what's going on. Oh, it's constant speed and you can even measure it. Just uh, take dx dt and you have velocity. And you, we developed some algorithms to do this automatically also. I just wanted to show you this as another example of thinking about your data and making the right choices in um, how to, uh, how to uh, integrate information to get uh, uh, robust estimates. Finally, some words about cell tracking. Cells are much bigger objects, so we have more information about them. Uh, many techniques have been de developed for this problem as well, as I told you before. Um, we're not going to go into details because I only have a few more minutes, but um, uh, here you can do a similar kind of uh, consideration, a thought experiment. Um, if I have a cell or a nucleus with some nucleoli in there, um, signal-to-noise ratio 1.5. You remember maybe from the particle tracking example, if you have a single sub-resolution particle with SNR 1.5, you don't see anything most of the time. Now I have a whole cell, which is much bigger, signal-to-noise ratio 1.5, and you can see it. Here there is a lot of spatial integration going on. So in the other example, it was temporal integration. Here it's more spatial is what your human uh, visual system does. You can even go as low as uh, 1.0 signal to noise and you can still see this thing. But now, if I ask you, can you outline this, the contour of this thing exactly for me? So what would you do? You would zoom in as much as you can to, to really accurately outline this cell. Okay, so I've done this for you, for this piece. I've zoomed in all the way. So now where is this contour? <laughs> Yeah, okay, you don't have the contextual information anymore and you're not able to do a good job. So here um, we really thought, okay, we have to integrate spatial information as much as possible. And this is where we use so-called level set segmentation methods that we can also use for tracking. So um, maybe you've heard the term to quickly explain it. Basically, it means that, for example, if you're interested in segmenting a two-dimensional object, if you want to find the contour of this object, um, and you want to use uh, all the information within that contour and around, what you could do is define a higher dimensional function. So if you're interested in a 2D contour, you can define a three-dimensional function, like a surface. That's this red surface. And you can define it like this. It's uh, phi, so i, you have, uh, you have such a function for each object that you want to segment. And uh, you could say, okay, so outside it has a value that is negative. Uh, when I'm exactly on the contour, it's supposed to be zero. And when it's inside, it's supposed to be positive. So that's what you see here. It's a surface in 3D. And I'm interested, I'm, I'm going to look at the zero level of this function. So where it's zero. So I make basically a cut through the surface. And this is what the contour of this surface looks like. So this is the zero level set of this three-dimensional function, which characterizes a two-dimensional contour. And just by shifting this surface up and down, in this case, you can already accommodate this kind of shapes. You can already segment this kind of shapes. And if I allow even much more flexibility, if I allow a full deformation of this whole surface, I can really accommodate any kind of shape I want, even if it's really uh, you know, topologically uh, problematic. If, if cells, for example, divide, that's what's modeled here, of course, a dividing cell, then you can still keep track of them. And at some point determine that they are separated and then assign a new level set function to the newly born um, daughter cells. Well, I will skip the, the mathematics of how you compute this stuff. Uh, we developed such a method, so it's called a, we call it a model evolution based cell tracking method because it uses these models of cell shape uh, in terms of level sets. And the way it works, this is also a kind of online tracker. You can uh, fit these surfaces to the, um, to the image information to find the optimal contour. You see here that the, uh, the contents of the cell, it's really, uh, you know, <laughs> uh, I mean, a bit noisy, all kinds of um, blobs and, and everything. Um, and if once you have an optimal fit, you can then project it into the next frame, fit it again. And then uh, going on like this, you can uh, track cells. And here you can use a uh, prior information too. 
uh, about the shape. That's what you can put into the, uh, the level set fitting procedure. You can input prior knowledge about shape, etc. And you could also use prediction here for the position going from one uh, time point to the next to build a tracker. So this is uh, an, an example. Uh, I hope you can see it in the back as well. Uh, the colored contours is what the, the algorithm found automatically. Um, these are just two examples of similar kind of data. And um, so even when the cell, uh, when the intensity in the cell goes down uh, just before division with this particular type of staining, uh, you're still able to keep track for a couple of frames. Of course, if this would take too long, you would lose it at some point, but it's a very, very robust technique. And you've seen this one before. Um, this is how we actually did that registration <laughs> to do motion correction um, for this particular cell. We just used that algorithm to segment and track each and every cell. And once you've done that, it's very easy to compute uh, for a given cell um, you know, the transformation from one frame to the next. You can take out any motion component you want and just look at the, um, the residue. Uh, another application is, uh, but this is basically an analysis on top of cell segmentation and tracking. Once you've segmented and tracked each cell, you can then start looking at what's going on within the cell. And uh, this was a study with um, someone from the genetics department, I believe. They were interested in studying uh, the cell phase. So they made movies of cells, of many cells, uh, using PCNA um, labeling, which is involved in DNA um, damage repair and replication, to look at the, the specific phototype patterns uh, that uh, appear in the different cell phases. And then you can automatically, using some machine learning technique, automatically um, find the transition points. You know that the cell cycle has many phases. Uh, and when you use PCNA, you really get distinct patterns in each phase. And you can use that uh, to automatically find them. And if you do this for many cells, you can try to align the cell uh, um, the cell phases and see if there's any uh, interesting statistics going on there. Final example, uh, embryonic development. So I showed you this before, I think. This is a, a phase contrast, but I showed you in the first slide um, a movie of um, this very dense, all these cells that were dividing. And um, C. elegans is used a lot in many biological experiments as a model organism. And uh, uh, our collaborators were interested in uh, doing some screening studies of, of, of drugs or a particular, I don't know what kind of factors they were, they were interested in, how this would distort the, the development of these embryos. So what you need to do if you want to do this in large scale with many subjects, um, you really have to automate the whole um, segmentation and tracking process to build this lineage tree. So it starts, of course, with a single cell, which divides, and this cell divides, and this divides. This whole lineage tree is known exactly for a C. elegans. 959 cells, it's always the same, supposed to be. Uh, this is not so in human beings, <laughs> obviously, but, uh, but in this model organism, it is the case. Um, and people know exactly what this lineage tree should look like. So th this is like an atlas. This is what it's supposed to be. And then when you make all kinds of mutations uh, and you, you want to study the effects, you just um, image this creature for uh, long enough and then uh, automatically segment and track all the cells to build this lineage tree and compare them with the atlas and see what happened. Um, actually, we're still working on this. We, we got to some point um, to about 180 minutes, which is just before the last division cycle. So we're not able to go all the way um, uh, up to the full adult organism, 959 cells, because it becomes really, really messy, this data. It's still a big challenge to, to build uh, better algorithms for this. So that's what I wanted to say about uh, method development in registration and in tracking. I, I want to come back to this issue again of validation. Just uh, if, if there's anybody uh, who's interested in, in, in this case, in particle tracking and also in cell tracking in the next slide. So what we really try to do now is to uh, make an objective comparison of all the methods that have been developed so far. Uh, the thing is what most people do when they develop a technique, for example, for particle tracking, 
They just build it because they have a specific biological problem, so they, they hire a postdoc and they this hex he makes a hacked um, a particle tracker and then they apply it to their problem and they publish their results and everybody's happy. But then uh, the next postdoc comes in and he has no idea how that method really works or uh, whether it's accurate enough for his problem and uh, in other words it has not been validated. Or uh, what happens in computer science labs, uh, people develop a method and they want to publish that in some computer science journal. So uh, you have to show that it's better than uh, all the other stuff that's out there. So what you do is you take those software packages from the web <laughs> and uh, you make that comparison. And uh, surprise, surprise, your method works best. Okay. Uh, it's not so difficult to, to, <laughs> to write papers like that, but it's, it's really, I mean, we've now come to a point that the literature, there are so many examples of this. I, I cannot verify it. I don't know if people faked anything. I, I, I'm not accusing anybody, but I, I can just see the problem, okay? There's, you cannot trust this, really. There's a big potential uh, bias. Uh, so what we really wanted to do now, and we started to do this last year, is to, okay, let's get together as a community let's define a data set in this case we limited ourselves to synthetic data because we could have the exact ground truth and then we invite all the people okay here's the data we have an independent guy who is not involved in this study he will look at the results here's the data you don't have the ground truth just apply your method and submit your results to this guy okay if everybody does that if they apply their own methods to this standard data set that we've chosen that is the best possible way at the moment that we could think of to to make an objective comparison of methods. So this is this is the concept of challenges. It's called a challenge. You define a data set, you invite everybody, just apply your stuff, submit your results, and this one independent or multiple guys will look at the results and will put, uh, put the results on the web. Okay, so we organized that last year for particle tracking. Uh, I don't have time now to present any of the results, maybe at some other occasion, but uh, it's very, very interesting. <laughs> We're going to publish it soon. Uh, and we did the same thing this year for cell tracking. Um, I show you the websites, I think, yeah, it's bioimageanalysis.org slash track for particle tracking. And this is the website for um, for cell tracking. We organized um, sessions also um, at the IEEE International Symposium on Biomedical Imaging, where we got together and discussed the results. It's very, very uh, fruitful, very, very stimulating for the field to organize such challenges. And I can really recommend that for any of your problems. Um, it, it really helps to um, both to, yeah, I mean, to, to get together and to learn from each other and to really have an objective comparison of methods. So that's a, like an added remark to your, uh, to your question. So this concludes this session. Uh, are there any questions, quick questions about this tracking part? Everything 100% clear? <laughs> Or 100% or unclear, <laughs> could also be. So what is the time right now? Oh, it's already, uh, we're already over time. So I would like to thank you very much for attending this session. If you have any specific questions afterwards, just come and see me and we can have a chat. Thank you.